and welcome to the TaxCast, the Tax Justice Network podcast. We're all about fixing our economies so they work for all of us. I'm your host, Naomi Fowler. You can find us on most podcast apps. Our website is www.thetaxcast.com. You can subscribe to the TaxCast there or you can email me on naomi at taxjustice.net and I'll put you on the subscribers list. Let me know what you think of the show. Okay, so this month on the TaxCast, the making of the tax haven of Mauritius. Small islands are particularly well suited to become tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions because in small islands, elite groups of people are also small and the financial and political engineering to set these things up almost always comes from outside, in partnership with these few island elites. What they do together may benefit them, but their actions have a disproportionate and harmful effect on millions of people across the world. That's certainly the case with the island nation of Mauritius. Mauritius is far from a big global player in terms of financial secrecy compared to other jurisdictions like the United States, Switzerland, Britain and Singapore, for example. I mean, it's ranked number 51 in our financial secrecy index, although don't get me wrong, it definitely offers some high levels of secrecy. But it's a much more significant global player in terms of helping multinationals underpay corporate income tax. It's ranked 15th in our corporate tax haven index. It's got tons of tax exemptions and almost non-existent transparency requirements for corporate reporting. The consequences really are deadly for ordinary people worldwide, particularly Indians and Africans. When you look at Mauritius, The state capture that's usually a strong feature of small island nations that go down this route isn't immediately obvious. I mean, Mauritius has long been praised for being Africa's shining star when it comes to its economy and its democracy. The Economist's Intelligence Unit has ranked Mauritius highly for years. This is YouTube news channel The Rooster Report. After Mauritius gained independence from Britain in 1968, the situation there looked pretty dire. After all, it had been reliant on sugar for economic growth for most of the colonial period, and many predicted that along with overpopulation, this would cause the country to fall into economic despair. For a while, these critics were right, as Mauritius was quite poor well into the 1980s. However, it was in the 1990s that Mauritius was able to pull off an economic miracle and become one of the wealthiest nations in Africa. Many put the Mauritian so-called economic miracle down to two main things early on. Free education for everyone from preschool to university. Obviously, that's always a good investment. And the establishing of special export processing zones. Almost no import duties, low energy costs and the free repatriation of capital, profits and dividends to an investor's country of origin. It is because of this that a ton of foreign investment is continuously poured into Mauritius. Hmm. But, as you're going to hear, there's a lot more to the so-called Mauritian economic miracle than that. Foreign investment is very often not what it seems and can in fact be money laundering on a massive scale. The Mauritian tax havenry and financial secrecy model is really hurting Africans and Indians. That's because... It's swallowing up billions in tax revenue. Here's Tax Justice Network researcher Rachel Etapoya in Malawi. It's shocking. Mauritius inflicts an estimated $2.5 billion of lost taxes on other countries every single year. India is affected and so are so many African countries. And the irony here is that Mauritius markets itself as the gateway to Africa for investment. But really, I think we should be calling it the getaway from Africa and for the amount of profits that are shifted out of the rest of the continent as a result of tax haven Mauritius. 
Of course, Mauritius is also losing out thanks to the setup of tax havens and plundered states that is our global financial system. Mauritius does get a taste of its own medicine. Mauritius is losing an estimated 450 million each year to tax havens. And at the Tax Justice Network, we've seen many times as the money flows start to rise through places like this, internal strains and conflicts are never far behind. What goes on in a small island democracy starts to become very important to other bigger outside actors. And the international harm the tax haven remodel is inflicting on ordinary people elsewhere can become self-harm. Back to the Economist Intelligence Unit's rankings of Mauritius. Here's the Rooster Report again. In the past few years, the country has been in a downward spiral. While Mauritius does well on almost every indicator, it has faced some criticism in regards to political leadership, as almost every prime minister has come from one of a handful of elite families. The country has also passed a few questionable bills into law. Widespread accusations of voter fraud and foreign influence in the 2019 elections, multiple suspensions of parliament, and, quite recently, the deployment of military police on protesters who were peacefully protesting. Therefore, we think it's fair to say that while Mauritius was a model for the African continent a year ago, if it doesn't fix up some major issues, it may soon lose its full democracy status. To understand what's happening in Mauritius, we need to go back in time a bit and take a look at external events and actors and fly about 5,000 kilometres to India. You know, we tend to believe that the tax havens are actually made in tax havens. But the reality is that it's actually the victim countries or the victim jurisdictions where these tax havens are really made. And it's all the illegal stuff, all the sort of evil stuff actually happens in the victim countries to enable formation of these uh, tax havens and to sort of enable the abuse of uh, various treaties and uh, various loopholes. This is a whistleblower in India who leaked data which exposed the underbelly of the Mauritian economic miracle. It's swallowing up of the tax revenue of nations who can least afford it and the key role played by Indian law firm Nishif Desai Associates, going back decades. Here's the journalist who broke the story of the so-called Desai papers, Mr J Gopikrishnan of the Pioneer newspaper. It is just like the Panama Papers or something like that. A tax firm owned by one Nishit Desai, Nishit Desai's firm, was advising firms how to evade the taxes from India by floating companies in London, Cayman Island, uh, Mauritius and how to. Uh, telling a thief how to steal its things. So we come out in July 2021. Big front page coverage. We uh, give a title, India's Panama Papers, Deshai Papers. It's a 1.5 GB documents of legal advisors how to avoid taxes. The 1.5 gigabytes of leaked data reveals tax-related correspondence between Nishif Desai Associates and 33 of India's biggest corporations and several high net worth individuals. Nishif Desai Associates deny that they or their clients have ever broken any laws. The whistleblower worked as a software engineer. He says he leaked the data in the public interest. Some time back, I had worked on uh, some software solutions to detect money laundering and uh, financial fraud, right? Especially like, you know, with the aim to identify terror cells and, uh, you know, other sort of money laundering fraud activities that happen, especially like across jurisdictions. So, um, you know, I had started understanding, you know, what goes on. These documents really basically show what goes behind the curtains. Because, you know, these documents clearly sort of provide advice to the clients that, you know, do this, do that. You know, that way the tax authority will not know that you've got a permanent establishment in India, create a structure over there, you know, have these kind of board members over there, dummy uh, board members 
in Mauritius. Don't give that person the signing authorities. You know, um, make the the key people in India as your advisors, uh, but not the managing partners or the general partners, right? Then sort of create more structures in Cayman Islands or like other jurisdictions where you will have holding companies or the beneficial owners would be over there, right? Um, even like how to sort of issue press releases. You know, what should be the wordings of the press releases? What should you put on the business cards? Um, how long should uh, your personnel stay in one office in in India, you know, how to keep shifting places, you know, all that stuff. This whistleblower, his lawyers and journalists claim these leaked files contain incriminating evidence of tax abuse. Again, Nishif Desai Associates deny any illegality in their or their clients' actions, although I'm sure they certainly wouldn't deny how central they are in terms of business that uses Mauritius. And all of this goes far beyond what's demonstrably legal or not. The so-called Mauritius route is causing serious tax losses to many nations. The whistleblower and his lawyer made this data available to the Enforcement Directorate at the Central Board of Direct Taxes in India and later to the Black Money Commission. Uh, Nothing happened because, you know, the statutory authorities as well as the government they are very reluctant to investigate these things or to take any action. Then my house was raided and uh, all my devices were taken away. And I'm I'm like a a software engineer. Even during the COVID times, you know, I didn't have access to my devices. You know, when like, uh, you know, we were working from home and uh, we were sort of, uh, you know, pretty much having a digital existence. You know, I, I did not have access to devices which were very, very critical for my profession. Uh, so their intention was, you know, possibly to intimidate me, but also they wanted to recover all the evidence which would be in my possession and perhaps also to figure out if uh, I have sort of approached authorities or who all I have sort of shared this thing with. According to him, during the raid on his house, armed police were accompanied by personnel from Nishif Desai Associates, as well as from the big accountancy firm PwC. Now, I find that interesting because a number of years ago now, in Luxembourg, staff from PwC were also present during a police raid on another whistleblower's house, their own employee, during the now infamous LuxLeaks scandal. That was Raphael Ali, who spent years in Luxembourg courts defending his right to have leaked in the public interest. With this raid in India, the court ordered that all the expenses of the raid be paid by Nishif Desai Associates, including the court commissioner and his assistant. Now, according to the whistleblower, the court commissioner was a friend of Nishif Desai. Nashif Desai Associates accused the whistleblower of accessing this data illegally and their civil case against him is ongoing, so he's unable to speak specifically about that case. But he stands by his decision. The public in India needs to know the scale at which this fraud is happening and how it's happening. The evil consequences of tax avoidance, you know, saying that it results in a substantial loss of revenue, it results in creation of a lot of black money, right? It sort of shifts the burden of taxation to uh, law abiding, you know, simple citizens and uh, people with artful uh, advisors are able to escape taxation. It results in a lot of inequality, injustice, right? It also results in a perpetual war waged between the tax avoider and his expert team of advisors, lawyers and accountants on the side and the tax gatherer and his perhaps not so skillful advisors on the other side. You know, we are hoping that uh, the authorities take some action because uh, there is like a wealth of data available to them now. There's no sign of that happening yet. And this wasn't journalist Mr. Gopi Krishnan's first time writing about Mauritius and its financial services. Some 15 years ago also, I wrote an article looking, going to the Mauritius registry. There are two, three buildings in Mauritius where hundreds of companies have the same address at the same office in the same cubicle. 
and these are pretended or covered in the garb of foreign direct investments into the country but actually uh, india's own black money coming back to make it as a white money through these small small countries nothing is happening there just money laundering and money parking and money diverting through just an address there is no uh, staffers nothing i always say these tax havens are the red streets in the cities that the what sorry uh, you know what is red streets red streets in every city red street means there is a prostitution street is there ah right yeah like red zones uh, you go you go to particular street and do the prostitution and other things activities don't come to this areas you do that area uh, where police will not come so these tax havens are the red streets in cities in this world i think uh, all nations and the united nations should come together and come out against this tax havens and finish this tax havens for the betterment of the entire world if they simply cancel all these things the matter is over when it comes to the making of mauritius as a tax haven we need to go back to some pivotal moments in that journey here's the whistleblower again the mauritius uh, indo mauritius uh, double taxation avoidance treaty um, it was actually signed in 1982 uh, at that time Uh, the prime minister of india was uh, mrs indira gandhi and the finance minister was mr pranav uh, mukherjee so they were visiting mauritius in 1982 and uh, they signed this agreement with mauritius uh, and it was finally notified by the government of india in 1983 right this was a purely an executive action this was never tabled before the parliament this had never been debated by the legislature it has not been passed by the legislature it has for the last several decades it has stayed like an executive action uh, this treaty was practically dormant till i would say early 90s right and the reason were twofold one was that uh, the indian economy till 91 was highly regulated and a closed economy similarly like mauritius was also a very sleepy economy so there was very little uh, trade or very little investments that could have happened between the two countries uh, but that started changing towards the late uh, 80s 1980s uh, in 1989 mauritius attempted to become an offshore banking center it was not very successful but it tried to sort of uh, become an offshore banking center in 1991 in india there were economic reforms which were initiated in 1991 and the indian economy was liberalized it became an open economy and uh, the indian government started encouraging foreign investment into india so right after that right after these reforms and uh, liberalization uh, mr nishid desai who's the founder of nishid desai associates a boutique international taxation law firm in india he somehow stumbled upon this indo mauritius uh, double taxation agreement and he reached out to the mauritius government he actually went to mauritius he spent some time in mauritius he became close to the government of mauritius and he helped them become an offshore tax haven we'll get back to the forward thinking mr nishif desai who spotted the potential of this double tax avoidance treaty around the same time india's economy was liberalized Mauritius enacted the Mauritius Offshore Business Activity Act. Mauritius Offshore Business Activity Act or like MOBA actually made it into a tax haven. In 1992 Mauritius actually became a tax haven. And uh, as part of this MOBA Act Mauritius allowed foreign entities foreign players who were not even citizens or residents of Mauritius to set up entities in Mauritius. Uh, which would basically provide them Mauritius tax residency certificate you know so by setting up what was known as a GBC1 company you could actually become a Mauritius tax resident and these shell companies did not attract any kind of taxation you know even if there was some taxation it was nominal 
by layering your GBC1 company with a GBC2 company and shifting your profits between them, you could virtually arrive at a zero taxation rate. So the Double Tax Avoidance Treaty combined with the Mauritius Offshore Business Activity Act made double trouble for the tax revenues of other nations. The Mauritius Offshore Business Activity Act meant foreign entities could incorporate companies with limited public disclosure, so some quite high levels of secrecy, and also there were some quite high levels of asset protection promised. The door was opened to all kinds of potential illicit activities and abuses. And this became like the most popular route to invest in India for the foreign investment this became like the route that all the foreign investors in the West were using to enter India. So these were like, you know, public market funds, private equity funds, VC funds, corporates, uh, high net worth individuals. As you can imagine, these are big players. And bigger and bigger players piled in on the action. The investments in India was definitely growing at that point of time. I mean, from virtually zero it was now several billion dollars of investment every year which was coming into India. But it was also resulting in a big loss of tax revenue to the Indian exchequer. Because, uh, you know, all the sort of capital gains and everything that was getting generated through these investments were not being taxed in India. And very soon, some Indians also started using this Mauritius route to round trip their funds. Round tripping, as the name suggests, is a circular activity and for no good reason. <laughs> Here's the Tax Justice Network's Rachel Etapoya. Round tripping. Sounds like a dance, doesn't it? I like to think of it as more of a disguise. So you take your money out of India to another country, and in this case Mauritius, then you bring it back into India, and now it's suddenly dressed up as foreign money, foreign investment. What's the point of this disguise? Well, many countries try to attract foreign investment by providing all sorts of special incentives. Tax breaks, tax holidays, and these aren't offered to local investors. So domestic investors get away with dodging tax and exploiting rules that are not meant for them. And eventually this ends up harming the very government systems and public infrastructure that they are relying on to make their money and do business. And, of course, another reason for the disguise is the good old fashioned money laundering, trying to clean dirty money. All these structures or all these investments that were flowing into India through the Mauritius routes were actually structured by Nishid Desai Associates. Almost like, uh, you know, I would say 99% of these investments were structured by uh, uh, Mr. Nishid Desai and his firm, Nishid Desai Associates. In a statement responding to the data leak, Nishif Desai Associates say there are good practical reasons why firms use a jurisdiction like Mauritius. Quote, they need a neutral jurisdiction for pooling vehicles which provide flexibility in terms of enforceability of contracts, simplified corporate laws, robust bilateral investment protection treaty with India, etc. There is absolutely no illegality in anything we or our clients have done. Close quote. Now, I've not seen this leaked data. The Indian authorities are the ones who should be looking at that. But let's take a look at Mr. Nishif Desai because his role is really interesting in the development of this business around Mauritius. His legal and tax consulting firm, Nishif Desai Associates, has offices now in Mumbai, Singapore, Munich, New York and elsewhere. They've definitely hit the big time over decades. Meanwhile, Mr Desai seems very admired in the business world. Here's entrepreneur Lakshmi Praturi introducing him for her interview series, the Lakshmi Leadership Lounge. Today with us, we have Nishit Desai. You know, Nishit his interest spans many things way beyond law. He's someone who thinks about the strategy, the future trends. He's a writer, he's a lecturer, he's a researcher. And most importantly, he's a constant learner. Uh, Nishit himself is regarded as the father of international tax in India. 
and as a true pioneer in the field of international tax law. Soon after India opened its economy in 1991, uh, that's when he really uh, kind of pioneered the roots of asset management industry in India. Uh, he has assisted the governments of Mauritius and India in launching their offshore financial centers and much, much more. And uh, today you will see uh, the pivotal role he's playing in defining the future of finance. And here's the man himself, Nishif Desai, speaking to Lakshmi Praturi. I learned and I said I have to change the model to put in a place of principle. We must do highest quality work in shortest possible time with least amount of people. Was anticipate, prepare and deliver. The best thing is to look to the future and prepare and visualize future strategic, legal, tax, or ethical issues today and try to find solutions, okay? So for example, every new technology, every new business model, every new social, political, economic development brings along with it a new strategic, legal, tax, or ethical issue. The future may be uncertain, but it's not unthinkable. If I start doing research on the subject that are going to come in the future, then we have not only understood the technology, we have understood the business models, which could be. So we started looking at what will the future technologies will appear in the next 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years as well. Nishif Desai, investigative journalist Misagopi Krishnan, who broke the Desai paper's story for the Pioneer newspaper, has a very different take on Nishif Desai and his firm doing business through Mauritius. He is a key player mixed with his legal background as a lawyer and his um, accounting firm. But he is not a big lawyer in India at all. Legally, he is nothing in India, but he is only doing this legal plus uh, tax activities. Uh, helping out uh, because all the corporate players want somebody to operate this thing. So he is doing as the service agent like uh, Panama's Papers, that legal firm. He was uh, doing this because he was not a legal firm in strictly big legal firm or something. Uh, he And he himself is not a man seen in the courts or uh, other things. But he was doing all these things. There have been various attempts during previous government administrations in India to tackle the so-called Mauritius route because of worries about the damage it was doing to Indian tax revenues, not to mention the money laundering risks. Here's the whistleblower again. It boils down to the fact that uh, the, the economic interest kind of dominates the political interest or the social interest. The government of India uh, obviously doesn't want to take any action against uh, the large corporations, large sort of financial institutions, high net worth individuals who are actually benefiting because of this uh, tax treaty or these uh, offshore structures. And of course, people like Mr. Nishid Desai and other people who have now come into this industry, they have excellent relationships with both the government of India as well as uh, the tax department, right? So, for example, uh, Mr. Nishid Desai was very, very close to the previous government from 2004 to 2014. So, he had very, very close connections over there. He obviously has like very good connections with uh, the tax department. In fact, it's quite common to see some of like very senior tax officers socializing with Mr. Nishir Desai quite openly, right? Uh, so, you know, so that, that way, the government itself is not very serious about prosecution. Now, what happens is like every now and then, there was uh, a whisper that uh, the government of India would want to renegotiate this agreement with Mauritius, may repeal it, uh, right? But the moment any such whisper would be uh, made public, there would be like a lot of pressure, it's very stiff opposition from government of Mauritius and the Mauritius root lobby. And, um, you know, the stock market would crash the very next day. 
um, uh, the f- investors would threaten a pullout and you know immediately the government would come up with a clarification that they were not thinking of uh, renegotiating or making any amendments to this tax treaty now the, now the question is is this mauritius route legal as per the indian law right and the answer to that is it's not uh, so i'm not talking about the legality of the treaty but i am talking about the legality of this mauritius route through which so you know majority of the investment into india was flowing in in 1985 there was a landmark judgment by a constitutional bench of uh, the supreme court of india which in, had like five judges and in that judgment the supreme court of india had taken a very dim view of sham transactions which are done for the sole purpose of avoiding tax the judgment make it very clear that as per the indian law what was happening through this mauritius tax treaty was actually not permissible any structure or any transaction which is done the sole purpose of avoiding tax is illegal and has to be struck down because if the person is a resident of india then obviously all the income all the capital gains accruing in india will be taxed in india you will not be able to avail the benefits of the double taxation agreement in case the person is deemed to be residents of both uh, mauritius and india the place where you have uh, effective management in the place of effective management will determine where this person is going to be the resident of and most of these uh, investments or these funds or these businesses you know who were investing in india they were actually operating out of india their key managements were professionals were in india their uh um, you know decision making was happening in india all the management decisions were been taken in india so their place of effective management was india the government of india has been turning a blind eye to the treaty abuse this is not something that we can blame just the mauritius government you know the indian government the indian corporate lobby the the economic interest they have been the driving force behind you know such a route to have been created and have prospered interestingly the indian mauritius double tax avoidance agreement formed the template for extraction from many african countries as the whistleblower explains right after uh, the mauritius route became the most popular route for um, investing into india several countries in africa they also signed a double taxation avoidance agreement with mauritius and these agreements were identical to what was signed by uh, the indian government the only thing that was different was uh, the government of india was replaced by uh, a different country that's it but you know the terms uh, the language everything of these agreements that was signed with the multiple african countries was identical to what was signed with india Mauritius has signed double tax avoidance agreements with at least 46 states worldwide, 18 of them African. Imagine the money flows. Here's Rachel Etapoya again. A third of African countries more or less have signed double tax agreements with Mauritius, and if that wasn't bad enough, another third are negotiating or awaiting ratification. We've seen some really interesting action taken by civil society allies and governments across the continent in the face of these highly problematic treaties. Tax Justice Network Africa took the tax treaty that had been signed between the Kenyan and Mauritian governments to the Kenyan High Court because of risks the treaty posed, they said, to the Kenya's revenue and, and for procedural reasons. So it was amazing um because in 2019 the court actually ruled in their favor that the government hadn't followed the correct procedure of tabling in parliament. So the double tax treaty was voided and declared unconstitutional. What was a bit disappointing though was that the court dismissed the substantive argument that the treaty would cause colossal damage and loss to the Kenyan economy or revenue. But just a year later in 2020 both Senegal and Zambia tore up their treaties with Mauritius. And Senegal said that the treaty had caused the country to lose over 250 million US dollars over 17 years. And Zambia said the move was necessary because the treaty wasn't balanced or fair. And according to one tax official that spoke 
with the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists. Companies were just using the treaty to reduce taxes paid in Zambia, and they didn't actually have any commercial activity in Mauritius. If you're wondering why the so-called Desai Papers leak didn't make a bigger splash, even in India, I asked pioneer newspaper journalist Mr Gopi Krishnan, who broke the story, why he thinks that is. None of the Indian media take it up or followed it up. Why? Because it was a report against the tax evasion of biggest companies in India who is advertising in every media. No media took it up. So this is the power of the corporates, power of the tax evaders. That's it. But the sad part of this is government is not jumping into the feature. Agencies are not jumping into this thing because these 33 files is a good document for the income tax and uh, enforcement director to launch uh, prosecution and uh, that's the saddest part happening in India. The government has not cracked down. I published the report in 2020 on the government sitting on the, the whistleblower's data and more than two years, but uh, nothing happened. The company is still there. They are still on this job because there is no action came against them. Normally, after our publication of this huge data, next day onwards in uh, in contacts and enforcement directors loose would have jumped into the company and interrogate and other things. That has not happened. Are you surprised? I'm not surprised, but I know this is how this big activities are going on when it comes to big big companies these things will happen and uh, uh, even if the legal cases somewhere it goes to arbitration legal arbitration is also some sort of settlement and arbitration means we decided to sit over a coffee or a drinks <laughs> so there will be a compromise reaches saying that you pay such and such or I pay you such and such, you pay such and such, issue is settled. This is how the financial crimes are settled. Time's moving on and the Indian authorities have not yet taken any action that we know about on this leaked data. So far, the only legal action has been a civil case against the whistleblower by Nishiv Desai Associates. That case itself has some oddities about it, according to the defending lawyers involved. But whether the so-called Desai Papers leak does demonstrate tax abuse or not, we already know that business transacted through Mauritius is resulting in serious tax losses to nations who can least afford it. We already know as well that Mauritius is exposing many nations to money laundering risks. As taxcasters will know, for the last 60 years it's been the OECD that's been setting international tax rules, largely in the interests of their member states. Those same member states tend to be the nations sucking the most out of what are often former colonies. As you heard earlier, some nations have now torn up their tax agreements with Mauritius, like Senegal and Zambia, and now it's going to take some superhuman efforts by countries like these, united in the United Nations, to reform the global rules that are allowing all this extraction. Rachel Etapoya again. It's a bit like whack-a-mole. One tax haven reigns in its ways, becomes more transparent and offers less corrosive tax deals. But then, what do you know, another one springs up. That's why it's so important that decisions on international tax take place at the only democratic space in the world, at the United Nations. And this is why we're still celebrating what happened last year when the African group put forward a resolution to start negotiations on international tax at the UN. And it was adopted by consensus. Although, of course, there were efforts by some of the richest nations to thwart the resolution in its path. And up until then, for the last 60 years, the international tax system was decided by the Club of the Rich at the OECD. And you could tell because it worked for them and it worked in their favour and they protected tax havens in their midst. 
No African country had a seat at the table and neither did India, and now they do at the UN. The extent to which the most affected nations can remain united in the forum of the UN is critical now. And the financial secrecy space is being squeezed slowly. But the role of whistleblowers continues to be critical because it brings what's happening in the shadows into the sunlight. That's why people like this whistleblower we've been speaking to and the media willing to report on them need our support and they do need strong public interest legal protections. Just as I was about to release this podcast, a fresh scandal involving Mauritius has been exposed by Hindenburg Research. They do forensic financial research to aid investment decision making, their own and that of others. They've spent the last two years looking at Indian conglomerate Adani Group's, quote, brazen stock manipulation and accounting fraud scheme over the course of decades, close quote. By downloading and cataloguing the entire Mauritius corporate registry, Hindenburg Research claims to have uncovered all sorts of stuff about the Adani Group. Adani family members dominate the business, apparently, with a vast network of offshore shell entities in all sorts of jurisdictions, with, Hindenburg says, quote, no obvious signs of operations, including no reported employees, no independent addresses or phone numbers, and no meaningful online presence. Despite this, they have collectively moved billions of dollars into Indian Adani publicly listed and private entities, often without required disclosure of the related party nature of the deals. Close quote. Hindenburg Research says they found funds, quote, intentionally structured to conceal their ultimate beneficial ownership, close quote, and, quote, Obvious accounting irregularities and sketchy dealings seem to be enabled by virtually non-existent financial controls. Close quote. Now this is big because the Adani Group founder and chair, Gautam Adani, is Asia's richest person. Now I have no idea whether Nishif Desai Associates has ever worked with the Adani Group, but they're both like planets that have turned around the same Mauritian sun. Like Nishif Desai, Gautam Adani is also from Gujarat. Many Adani companies were incorporated decades ago when Nishif Desai Associates had a near monopoly on the so-called Mauritius route. Lots of these Adani structures look to be GBC1 entities, which enjoy low or no taxation through the Indian Mauritius Double Taxation Avoidance Agreement. And whether any of these business transactions have been illegal or not, whether or not there's ever been a working relationship between the Adani Group and Nishif Desai Associates, these two stories confirm just how deeply offshore opacity has become embedded in the Indian economy, like so many others. And that's a threat to people and to societies. So, Mauritius has now become infamous. Businesses that choose to use it really should think about the reputational risks. The Adani Group had more than $50 billion wiped off its stock market value in the days following the Hindenburg Research Report and its allegations. The Adani Group wrote a 400-page response claiming it's been in compliance with all laws. Hindenburg Research says the Adani Group hasn't addressed, quote, a single substantive issue we had raised, close quote. I'll leave you with this final quote from Hindenburg Research. Quote, We believe the Adani Group has been able to operate a large fraud in broad daylight, in large part because investors, journalists, citizens and even politicians have been afraid to speak out for fear of reprisal. Close quote. You've been listening to the Taxcast from the Tax Justice Network. We'll be back with you next month. Bye for now.